with that, I will call to order this uh, Smart Cities and Service Improvements Committee for, uh, what is today? Thursday, November 5th. Let's go ahead and begin. Um, I think we have some uh, amendments to make to orders of the day. Is that right? We have to add um, two new items. Is that right, Rob? Uh, one add is the privacy policy update, sir, and one amendment. Uh, the city website and is also update is now the city website and digital services update. Okay. Can can I go ahead and get a motion to approve that for my no. colleague? No. Oh, a roll call. Sorry. Roll call. Roll call. Sorry. Get ahead of Davis. Present. Davis. Here. Licardo. Jones. Present. Yep. Present. Thank you. Now you can go. All right, can we get a motion for for that, please? So moved. moved. Second. All right. Um, on the motion to uh, make the amendments to the orders of the day. Jimenez? Yes. Davis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Yep. Aye. Thank you. All right, well then on to our first item. Um, go ahead, take it away, Rob. Sure, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman, uh, Mayor Ricardo, <laughs> committee members and members of the public, Rob Lloyd, Chief Information Officer for the city. We're glad to be here before you. Um, moving on from last month's items of digital inclusion and the digital services transformation, this month we have a very full agenda with four major strategic items and initiatives, starting with the Smart Cities Roadmap as we add a layer of project status reporting for the future. Uh, we also have the privacy policy update to operationalize privacy in the organization, uh, followed by the, um, the new city website, uh, the committee update the committee asked for. We're coupling with the digital services update, um, which is prompted in large part by COVID-19. And last, we'll discuss the initiation of the IT strategic plan process. So to start us off, we have Reginie Nair and Michael Foster uh, with the Smart Cities update. Thank you, Rob. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Honorable Mayor, and members of the uh, committee and public. My name is Reginie Nair, Deputy Director of Environmental Services, and I'm here with um, my uh, colleague, Michael Foster, Division Manager, uh, Information Technology. So next slide, um, Michael. One more. In August, we presented our approach with the roadmap refresh for the fall uh, to the members of the committee and public that prioritize projects with a focus towards COVID-19 response. We shortlisted a total of 22 projects that are highlighted in purple. Next slide, please. We also stated in August, we needed to shift our priorities on the roadmap to better reflect the work we must do today in response to COVID. Next slide. This is the current status of the projects for the month of November. Our projects that are gray are currently on hold. This is mainly because the core team involved with these four projects are actively involved with the EOC on a full-time basis. The three projects that are in yellow had some minor setbacks due to schedule or some scope modifications, but still are moving forward. On the next slide, I'll share more in detail about the one project that is highlighted in red. So with the FirstNet deployment, uh, it's red primarily because there was a delay originally in the schedule due to some staffing challenges and some initial pilots that were extended further than anticipated. Um, that was all resolved, but then later on it was determined that additional budget was needed due to some anticipated expenses that incurred. Uh, therefore, that impacted the schedule again. So currently, the city manager's office is uh, determining how to close that funding gap. Next slide. And, and I'll just jump in on that just a second, uh, if you could back yeah, up, sure. Reginie. Yeah, so yeah, sure. just a reminder, FirstNet is um, the essentially the extra band that we get, band 14 for first responders and extended uh, uh, first responders to have a more secure communications link. Um, in the event of a, a large scale disaster, such as an earthquake. And um, the deployment includes not only phones, tablets, devices, but also vehicles, our, our trucks uh, and our police cars to make sure they're connected. Uh, I've been personally involved with the team to make sure that the, the gap uh, is closed. And a lot of it 
is actually um, uh, shifting resources around that were allocated toward allied priorities. And there's a significant amount of savings we've achieved with AT&T. So bottom line, as Reginie says, we've, we've got a, a path forward on this, but I just kind of wanted to remind people what, what FirstNet was. Go ahead, Reginie. Thank, thanks, Kib. Next slide, Michael. Um, comparing our progress from spring to now, you, you, you can see a significant reduction in the number of projects. Um, and as stated uh, earlier, uh, this is primarily a focus on projects that provide a, a greater impact in city's response to COVID, um, you know, uh, and and despite our circumstances, I mean, city staff is doing a great job moving these innovative projects forward. I mean, we're still uh, you know, sixty-four percent moving forward, you know, on projects that are going very well. And as we've been operating prior to COVID and currently in the EOC, um, we we do recognize the need that we have to remain agile by taking small iterative steps to address any roadblocks quickly so that we can continue to support staff in delivering these projects to our community. Also, these monthly reports hold us accountable to make sure that we're putting resources where needed to ensure the success of these projects. Next slide, please, Michael. And obviously this approach has resulted in many great successes and what you can see just a, a small percentage of a lot of our projects that we uh, were able to deliver and support ongoing needs for our community uh, with food distribution digital inclusion community engagement and public health awareness um, we are now at a point where we can transition from project tracking to project performance and success uh, the support of a very special city division uh, in information uh, or a team in a city within the information technology led by my colleague, Michael Foster, who will explain. So take it away, Michael. All right. Thank you, uh, Regine. I really appreciate that. Uh, glad to meet everyone here. I'm relatively new to the .gov world, as I say, coming from the .com world. Just to explain to you what um, I am doing, I am the division manager for the City Portfolio Products Projects Office, or C3PO. Um, and just to tell you how that sort of fits in, you've been hearing from Regine for quite a while here on things like the Smart City Roadmap and Small Wonders, which uh, have covered the areas of experimentation and planning. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of execution in that as well. But C3PO's focus is going to be primarily on the execution. So we are here to make sure that um, basically things get out the door and succeed. And another way to explain that is with the next slide, which is about when does C3PO get involved? Um, so C3PO steps into the mix here in, I would say, the large, more complex, and more visible projects. So we kind of have a definition here that is, that is being put um, actually directly into policy, which is if it's greater than half a million dollars or it involves more than one department or it's greater than one year in execution or it's high profile or sensitive to the city, an IT project um, should be, involve C3PO. And my team of uh, product project managers will make sure that that project becomes a success. So on the next slide, you can see that C3PO are actually involved in managing many of the projects you've, you've heard about and seen on the Smart City Roadmap before. And we're likely to get involved in even more of these in the future. So we'll be, we'll be continuing to do this and I specifically will be taking over Regine's um, job of presenting this to you because um, Regine has a new job. She might wanna talk about that. Um, but uh, I think the next part is going to be, uh, Kip is going to do a little bit of thanking of some of the team involved. Yeah, so I, I, I'm gonna get to talk about Regine's new job um, and I'm not sure she even knows all the things I'm gonna say. So, um, you know, we, we, we believe in, and it's a, it's a truism that, that technology and technology work is in the end powered by people. And so we wanted to acknowledge some of the great people we've had work on the team who have had uh, transitions in different ways in their life uh, onto different uh, pieces and different professional avenues. So I want to I want to touch upon uh, a couple of those transitions with with uh, and dwell a little bit longer on two of them in particular. So wanted to acknowledge and appreciate Yasmin Fatima, who really has set us up right on Recycle Plus. Uh, the whole Recycle Plus 
experience if you have issues with, with your garbage or you need to do a large junk pickup um, uh, or, or you even need to figure out sort of what's going on with, with, with my collection has been something where you've, we've, we've managed to make it less painful than it was in the past, but it's still quite a, an exploration to figure out what's going on and to make sure you're getting service. And frankly, once you make a request, we on the city side don't really know what that customer experience is like or wh whether you've been responded. The work that uh, Yasmin set us in place will uh, uh, ultimately have that Recycle Plus function integrated into the 311 app and allow us to have seamless uh, ability for you to say, hey, uh, you didn't pick up my recycling or I need a large junk pickup and, and have that done uh, with a single experience, no matter who your service provider is across across the uh, entire city. So that's pretty damn cool. Uh, Nira Data, and, I, and she has the perfect name for this, really pioneered a lot of our work around data-driven user interface and user experience. Um, and she and her partner, Julie, were really helpful in some huge insights that are continuing to inform our work uh, I'll, I'll give you just two examples that she she taught me on that, that that are pretty fascinating. One is that we found out that when we give clear expectations for customer time frames, and we are actually correct in those time frames, that people are extremely satisfied with the service, even if the customer time frame is pretty long. Um, and that, so that there's a, uh, it is much much better to clearly communicate a longer time frame than to uh, disillusion somebody and say we'll get to this and then have a longer time frame, which is somewhat self self evident. But the the swing on that was huge. And so we realize now, and part of what we're working on, uh, especially as, as things have shifted this COVID era, is making sure that our communication out is a bit more correct and coherent around what those time frames are. The other piece she gives a series of insights around language, which we are guiding, and you'll hear more. Uh, next smart cities committee on this but one of the fundamentals that that was really interesting around language translation is her research identified that the most important first step in language two of the most important first steps in language translation are one having the plain english really plain and clear so that you're translating clear uh thought into the other language not a bunch of gobbledygook and jargon into gobbledygook and jargon in another language and that two a clean iconography um, and a clean user experience without linguistic cues was as important as getting the language right. So we've been placing greater emphasis on plain English and clear and clean iconography that people can use regardless of language in addition to uh, some pioneering work on machine language translation, which you'll hear about in December. Uh, Sarah Papazagalakis, who uh, has been a real forerunner in how we're thinking about privacy, um, has brought to get us together with some brilliant minds around privacy and been able to hand that work off to Andrew. And you'll hear a little bit more about that today. She was also deeply, deeply instrumental in our early food work uh, and helping us think and pilot some work with Google and prepare for the, the scaling of our food experience from how do we feed 875 seniors to how do we now do about 1.4 million meals a week. And then Kirsten Olston, led a lot of our work around digital inclusion and the formalization of our partnerships with community-based organizations, all of which have now pivoted to be supporting us in the COVID response. So I, I want to thank um, those four amazing women uh, for, their, for their leadership as they all pass on to uh, additional career opportunities outside of the city. Um, and we're, we're supportive of them and proud of them as they move on. We've got two people that we've we've kept inside, um, and uh, and I think are pretty powerful representation as well. J Dot, J Dot, uh, who you know as a broadband manager, um, has has taken us essentially from uh, a, 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 what I call a pull pull by pull knife fight to what I think is now, if not the one of the most uh, rapid permitting processes in the entire country with small cells and and some of the best re working relationships with our telcos anywhere in North America. Uh, because of his ability to do that, uh, uh, Public Works has snatched him up and promoted him to a deputy director role in Public Works, which is extremely uh, significant and high level of responsibility for him. Um, it's also pretty amazing because his PhD is actually in literature uh, and his thesis was on uh, uh, something around bicycles, which I really still don't even fully understand myself. Um, so in addition to sort of that bent, he's managed to, to, to wow the engineers and, and develop a high, high level engineering team. And then last, but certainly not least, our next uh, graduate and, and very significant promotion is our own Regine Nair. Uh, Regine's work uh, has helped us in a number of different ways. The one that I wanna highlight is actually the work that you've seen around the roadmap 
She's really matured that roadmap, brought it to a level of discipline and a sort of sneak peek teaser trailer. You in the council are gonna be seeing a version of this roadmap that builds on her work around the citywide priorities for the very first time in November. Uh, and then we'll be bringing that to you for deeper discussion and decision on your part uh, early next year as well. So that a lot of the work that she's done on how do you focus prioritization? How do you understand if things are on track or off track? We're gonna be bringing to you and for the first time ever having a citywide strategic view on what is most important and where we are and where we aren't. So her work was very instrumental in, in us understanding and moving that forward. Um, because no good deed goes unpunished, she too has been promoted to a deputy director position, this time in our environmental services department. She brings a, a solid engineering background. She is a civil engineer and a, a civil person uh, and, and, and really gets back to her engineering roots with this, but bringing in some of the agile methodologies, some of the tech approaches, some of the innovative ways of thinking that I think will really add a lot to environmental services. I think, again, I, I dwelt a little bit of, uh, longer on this than than maybe normal because this is so important. I think it is important in twofold. One, as, as uh, you know, I learned when I was in the dot-com world with Michael, uh, people don't necessarily stay in positions for 30 years like they used to, and that's okay. So part of what we have to get used to is shepherding and having great people with us for a shorter period of time. Um, and then the other thing is, if you've got really good people who are exceptional leaders, you do want to make sure they have the space to grow within the organization. So Regini and Jay represent a really amazing next generation of senior talent who are growing in the org. So with that, uh, I'll close with a personal appreciation to Regini, and uh, thank you for all of the good people who have uh, been part of the innovation team as we go forward. All right. Thanks, Kip. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, we'll go to public comment. If I'm trying to see my screen, if there are public comment, there usually is. Yes, of course. Mr. Beekman, you have a minute. Go ahead or two minutes. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. Two minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully there can be more people than myself who attend these sort of meetings. But for me, uh, for the beginner here, uh, thank you for this item. Um, it was nice to hear words about uh, emergency operations services things. And uh, it's always nice to hear that. Uh, I, you know, the way they work is always, uh, it's, it's pretty direct and they, they need to work pretty matter of fact on things and they don't uh, dilly dally about issues. So it is, I, I, li I like working with emergency services uh, and their thinking and ideas. Um, I have been writing to yourselves that through October, I've been asking uh, for yourselves to get back to me on what exactly you in your smart cities roadmap, you've, you've stated that you have mapped out a good IOT policy ideas. And I'm, I'm interested in exactly what those ideas can be. I've written to yourselves many times now. And uh, I, if I write again after this meeting, can someone write me back to, to explain what, what are the public policies and the, and the overall policies that you've developed for IoT at this time? And uh, to conclude, I, you, know, you have new people uh, uh, coming in. And uh, I just wanted to offer my, my, my welcome and that, you know, the ideas that, uh, you know, that uh, openness and accountability and good practices with the community are really possible and that are actually, you know, like what I always say, there's some of the most innovative things about technology at this time and most interesting and how you make connections with the community and how community can ask you questions about the technology you're using. That's the whole enchilada, I guess is the term, you know, and that's that's the enjoyment and that's the good that, that can come out of this whole process. So I will be saying that more again today and as usual. So thank you uh, for this item. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we, okay, so uh, the person with the number ending in 5140.
Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. All right. So I want some time back, and I'll tell you why. Because all these computers and digital innovation, and, you know, Zoom doesn't work on, on many people's computers, nor does, you know, having to call in and key in all these numbers. Then when I get called on, I got to reopen my phone. Like, I mean, there needs to be something better than Zoom that I can put on my phone or my computer. So but, uh, the best way is just to call in and, and ask you all, you know, key in these numbers. It's really a pain in the neck. And a lot of people call in, they can't hear, the Zoom doesn't work. And, you know, you're going to have a, a C3PO. We're going to have a C3PO computer. What is C? I mean, what is it, a Star Wars movie? I mean, this is ridiculous. You guys spend tens of millions of dollars on tech and all these tech savvy people. And now you're telling me there's a guy who writes poetry about bicycles and he's doing this innovative thing. This is what this sounds like. This sounds like a, a sophomore in college uh, dorm room project that you people have, you know? And, and guess what? It's not going to become Facebook or Microsoft or Google. You guys need to get your act together and get this bit and get the, I mean, the 311 app is a pile of poop, by the way. That doesn't work either. So you guys are going to have to build better technologies for people to use, especially in the time of COVID. I mean, I can't, I mean, the city gave me a citation. I can't even go down and fight it because the court is closed. You know, the, the computer systems are all screwed up. You guys, you guys like it this way. I mean, look at how they're trying to count the votes in places. Cities and counties, states, they love disasters. So you can just, you know, pile on more money and look like you're saving the day. You're not. And you guys need to fix this thing with Zoom. You need to fix your 311 app. You, you, and, and on top of that, if you guys can't take, if you can't pave the roads and fill the potholes, you can't do anything, and that's a fact. Because fixing potholes and paving roads is old as time; it's gone back millennia. Now, all of a sudden, you guys are going to build supercomputers to make it easier for us to deal with city hall and the county and everything else. You guys are delusional. And the best thing is, is the innovation at the police department. I mean, you, you guys can Okay. Um, we'll return to my colleagues. Uh, any, anybody, my colleagues, um, go, Mayor Licardo, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to uh, express my gratitude to Reginie and, and to Jay Dot and the entire team. Um, you know, I'm glad to see folks are getting opportunities to, uh, to spread their wings and, and, uh, and, and move up the organization. But it's uh, certainly a loss for, for our team. Uh, so I really appreciate all the great work they did and, and everybody, uh, Kip, I really appreciate you um, describing the contributions of each of the six uh, members of the team who've, who've moved on in different ways. Um, I know this leaves us obviously with very big gap in terms of our uh, ability to uh, do this very important work. And I'm just wondering if there's a particular strategy we're, we're looking at now to see how we can uh, ensure we still have a robust um, digital and innovation effort. Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, I, I would say it's it's two things. One is it's ruthless prioritization, right? So we, we have been, as you've seen with the roadmap, you know, going from 40 something items to 20 something items. So it's a more realistic um, uh, resizing based on, on, on some of the reductions in the size of the team. The, the other one is we are going to be backfilling uh, some of the, the positions or hiring some of the positions backfilling is such a good bureaucratic term. Um, and so, we, you know, part of what we feel, what we know we've been able to do is we've been able to attract extremely talented people with a lot of diverse experience. So we expect uh, that uh, both uh, as we rehire uh, Jay's position and Reggie's position, we'll be doing kind of two things with that. One, evaluating what it is that we need in them. So we're not just going to necessarily slot them in. As you can see already, we figured out that we can uh, shift some of the um, um, responsibilities over to IT, but we really, we really do need to figure out how are we going to do this on a sustainable way. I think bringing yeah. in a couple of high-powered people will make a lot of difference. But in the end, I think one of the, the difficult sets of decisions we're going to need to bring back to you is what do we stop doing so that we can focus on what's most important, um, and also how do we build a larger innovation team across the city. I think one of the things. Mayor, that you push for that you actually see incarnated in what Michael's talking about is how do we make sure that we build the capacity to deliver technology projects across all of the departments and what the 
uh, what the unit that Michael is hitting is, is making sure that we're doing is doing that with every big complex project that has significant impact, really assuring that the lessons that have been learned here are going to be with that project, whether it's in the Department of Transportation, whether it's in public works, whether it's in, in police or fire. So I think that effort that Michael is leading and that approach is going to be the best way to uh, best bang for the buck in terms of how we institutionalize some of the, the things that we've we've won. But again, ruthless prioritization, bringing in some more talented people, um, and then and then sort of evangelizing it through the organization would be the three uh, approaches that we have at this point. I'll be honest, it's going to be a bit of a struggle, but I do think we've reached a tipping point uh, in the city as a whole with some of these practices. Thanks, Kip. Thanks for all your work. Great. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Chair. I just want to echo uh, what the mayor said. Uh, I, I, I'll be honest with you, uh, coming from the private sector, with over 25 years of private sector experience, especially in tech, uh, I had a bias in terms of uh, my perception of the level of talent and skills on, in the private sector versus the public sector. And I have to tell you that um, my um, perceptions were totally wrong. Uh, I've been so impressed by the quality, the intellect, the professionalism, and the expertise of uh, all the members of the team that I've worked with and seen the, the product and the fruits of their, uh, their efforts. And I'm very proud of what you've been able to accomplish and what we've been able to accomplish as a city. And I'm also very proud to have the opportunity to work with you and uh, experience your, your talents and expertise. And, and, Congratulations on your um, promotions and your advancements, and we're looking forward to a bright future. I, just one last comment in terms of um, Jay moving on from a pole by pole knife fight. I'm still in the knife fight, so <laughs> Jay, any uh, you know words of advice or wisdom that you can give us uh, on your way out of uh -huh. the out of the scrum? I think he's, I think he's uh, already transitioned on and has left us to our own devices. Oh, okay. We so, lost him already. <laughs> he lost him already. I'm sorry, oh, Vice Chair. All right. Well, I'll, I'll <laughs> save that question to ask him directly. But again, congratulations. And we're, I'm very impressed in terms of what you've accomplished. To quote the late Sean Connery, bring a, bring a gun. <laughs> there you go. Well, that's the San Jose way. <laughs> um, I, uh, I have no comments except to say that uh, I, I'm, I'm really glad to see the work done on the iconography stuff. I know we've been getting some slack, uh, some flack rather, uh, on, on um, you know, the, our temporary um, stop or, or delay in services because of everything that's going on. But it's important that we're, we're continuing to perfect the app best we can and uh, transcending languages. So, so the, the iconography stuff is, is big. So, so thanks for that. Um, can I get a motion to approve or the report, accept the report? So moved. Second. All right, uh, on the motion. Jimenez? Yes. Davis? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Jones? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right. Uh, motion passes. We'll move on to the second item. Uh, go ahead, Rob. Sure. So we see clearly how privacy is foundational to our city's progress on data and technology uh, as it paves the way for adopting new approaches both quickly and in a way that protects our residents. As you'll hear, cybersecurity is connected to privacy, but, but actually separate. Uh, and so Andrew Eric, and uh, as our data privacy lead and Marcelo Pareto as our chief information security officer are working hand in hand with city departments and expert partners on these efforts. So with that, uh, Andrew and Marcelo. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Kip. And good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Honorable Mayor, members of the committee and members of the public. My name is Andrew Eric, assistant to the city manager and city data analytics lead. I'm joined by my colleague, Marcelo Pareto, the City Information Security Officer. And today we will be presenting for review input and cross-reference to the full City Council, a draft of the city's first ever digital privacy policy, as well as proposed next steps towards implementation. We'll start with a review of why digital privacy is important to San Jose and to our community. Uh, and fundamentally it's important because uh, becoming more innovative, more digital, more data-driven as a city 
means accelerating adoption of digital tools and platforms. And as this committee knows well, uh, the city has been doing that in an accelerated manner over the past few years, and that is only likely to accelerate uh, as we find ourselves in a new era of COVID-19. And of course, all of this work in progress represents enormous opportunity for the city to transform the way that we serve our community, but it also presents risks that the data and information that is collected, stored, and used in these digital platforms uh, could be used in unauthorized or undesirable ways. So the, the types of information that we're talking about when we, when we talk about protecting privacy uh, are what is classified as PII or personally identifiable information. PII is information that can be used directly or indirectly to identify an individual. We consider PII to include the five categories of data and information that you see on this slide. Personal data, sensitive data, image data, recording data, and geolocation data. And the draft policy before you today would cover uh, all systems and processes uh, that the city uses containing data in these categories. And the reason that we care specifically about PII is that that information can be used to identify an individual and it can also uh, in that case or in that sense uh, be used to cause harm. The adverse effects of the misuse of PII can range from less serious annoyances from receiving an unwanted telephone call to very, very serious harms in the form of discrimination, bias, economic loss, or physical harm. Uh, and so uh, it's incredibly important that we take care to protect this data and prevent these harms from affecting members of our community. As Rob said at the outset, when we talk about privacy, uh, we're really talking about two things, two types of risks. One is risks that arise from unauthorized access to personally identifiable data. And the other is risks that arise from authorized access. Cybersecurity, the left-hand blue circle, is all about preventing unauthorized access. That in itself is an incredibly important and difficult job and Marcelo and his team uh, do it quite well. However, as a city, we don't just wanna lock up our data and throw away the key. We want and need to authorize access and share information to data, both internally within departments and with our partners, uh, if we can do that safely because data is what enables us to deliver services that are more effective, efficient, and equitable. So the privacy policy that you'll hear about today is mostly concerned with protecting risks from authorized access, the green circle on the right-hand side. Um, but these circles, as we've talked about, are very much tied together, and they each focus on protecting the same corpus of PII, or personally identifiable information. Um, so because it's important to understand them together, and in particular because uh, it's helpful to understand the scale of data and information that we're talking about when we talk about uh, PII that the city uses or collects. Um, I'm going to hand it over for a brief overview of our cybersecurity work from City Information Security Officer Marcelo Pareto. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Kip. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Honorable Mayor, members of the committee, and public. The cybersecurity team has conducted a preliminary data assessment on where we have privacy data based on the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. And in that preliminary data gathering, we safely concluded that there is at least 9.8 .8 million records containing PII and rounding that off to 10 million records. Uh, we also, based on uh, data that we gather in the industry, we've seen about 50% of increase in, in the number of attacks uh, to municipalities and sister cities across the country. And so, of course, that, that uh, you know, combined with what we've seen in what it costs to recover from one of those attacks, whether it's ransomware or whether it's data being leaked and, and data and in the wrong hands, uh, we realized that Atlanta, Baltimore, and other cities uh, could have done uh, things to prevent some of those items. And of course, operationalizing the privacy policy will yield some of those results that we're looking for. We want to make sure that we only collect what we need. We want to make sure that we keep only the data that we use. And of course, that concept of data minimization comes really into play. Again, based on NIST, our way of analyzing risk or assessing risk is that we look at the threats, the vulnerabilities, the impact, and the likelihood of those vulnerabilities getting exploited. 
And so in the last few months, and based on all those, the other, uh, all those other uh, data points mentioned earlier, we've seen that the threats have gone up, vulnerabilities have gone up. The impact has been the same because it's the same data, but the likelihood of that uh, uh, you know, vulnerability of those vulnerabilities being exploited has gone up as well. And therefore the risk has gone up. And so the risk has changed due, due to COVID-19 and is especially targeting our, our uh, home-based workers with phishing scams, scams, malware, social engineer, engineering, and impersonations. Uh, next slide, please. On the left, you see our current cybersecurity approach. We've actually had a, a detailed presentation on our risks in our closed session back in October 27 last week. And so I'm not going to go into uh, the level of detail, but again, you can see that for the last three years or so, we've been maturing the cybersecurity framework uh, again, and it's based on NIST. And we have a formalized process and we're looking into maturing those process. And of course, our way, our way of assessing the maturity of those uh, procedures and processes uh, is also a, a standard way of doing that. On the right, we have some of those gaps that we that Andrew was uh, alluding earlier, and we want to make sure that our, our privacy principles and our future policy are able to address those uh, those specific gaps. With that, uh, I'll turn it back to you, Andrew. Thanks, Marcelo. Um, and so, when we think about these ten million records that the that the city uses. Uh, our North Star is that a citywide privacy policy is crucial to safeguarding the public's trust as we, uh, as we deliver services to them, as we uh, collect or use their data, and as we adopt new processes and technologies to better serve them. So let's quickly remind ourselves of where we were last time we left off on our privacy journey. In September 2019, City Council passed the City of San Jose Privacy Principles, which affirm the values that we hold when it comes to privacy and the fact that we consider privacy to be an inherent human right. As was discussed with the committee at that time, the principles were the first of four phases of this work, moving from principles to policy to implementation and to continuous improvement. Phase two, focused on develop, developing a city privacy policy, began in late 2019. However, as we all know, in early 2020, COVID-19 changed a lot of things and privacy work was paused as staff dedicated to that work was redeployed to the Emergency Operations Center in response to the pandemic. And due to the fiscal constraints uh, placed on the city as a result of the pandemic, uh, one-time funding for our senior privacy policy analyst, uh, Sarah Papazaglakis, uh, in 2019-2020, uh, that funding was not continued for 2020-2021. And so as we return to this privacy work, uh, we face several layers of uncertainty, uh, which you can see in the gray box in the bottom right. First, uh, future funding availability for privacy work uh, is uncertain. And as we'll discuss later in this presentation, the city's ability to invest in this work will determine the nature of the implementation uh, of the policy that's possible. Uh, second, uh, there is no current federal approach to digital privacy. And uh, I imagine as we're likely all aware, uh, the next federal government is currently being decided as we speak. Uh, so that status quo uh, of a, a lack of federal approach has the potential to change. Uh, and that change would alter the city's approach and its priorities. Uh, but that is very much unknown at this time for a variety of reasons. And lastly, it's important to remember that uh, privacy itself is a very dynamic area of policy. It's constantly evolving as new technologies uh, come, uh, come in into circulation and public opinion continues to change on the matter. So the question for us is, how can we craft a digital privacy policy for the city amidst this uncertainty that we can use as a foundation for implementation that meets the needs uh, and meets the principles laid out in the city's privacy principles? but that we can also adapt depending on future circumstances. Based on our research of the privacy landscape, we believe a good place to start here is to look to the General Data Privacy Regulations or GDPR. GDPR is a human rights-based privacy framework adopted by the European Union in 2016. And since that time, it has become um, the world's leading privacy framework. It has been formally and informally adopted by private and public sector organizations worldwide. 
And we believe it will likely serve as a framework or a backbone uh, for a lot of federal, state, or local approaches moving forward. Um, so what is GDPR? Uh, GDPR consists of uh, three main things, which you can see on this slide. The first is a set of privacy principles um, that uh, align, that are not identical, but align quite closely with our city principles. Uh, there is a series of detailed articles uh, that lay out standards for implementing those principles, and then a governance structure for implementing policy, privacy policy in large organizations. We believe that San Jose should model, not copy, but model our policy after GDPR for these four reasons. Uh, first and foremost, GDPR aligns with our approach to privacy, our privacy principles. GDPR is a privacy framework based on the idea that privacy is a human right, and San Jose in its principles believes the same thing. Second, basing our policy on GDPR can help us to accelerate policy development and implementation because we can learn from best practices around the world as this framework is adopted by more and more organizations. Third, in an environment of uncertainty, aligning ourselves with GDPR is likely to ensure that we're aligned with future evolutions of privacy policies uh, that we'd be likely to see at the federal or at the state level. And finally, GDPR, as the world's leading privacy policy, will help to ensure that San Jose continues to lead in smart city policy development. So uh, as I said, there are many components to GDPR, but when we think about it, we really think about two core processes that would be key to implementation. Um, the first core process uh, is the risk assessment. Uh, risk assessments are processes performed assessing project systems or systems or technologies across the city to understand uh, their risk level as it pertains to privacy based on what type of PII they uh, store or collect, as well as how those systems are used. The second core process of GDPR is undertaken for systems with high risk scores as determined by the risk assessment. And that's a more in-depth data protection impact assessment that identifies any actions or protections that are needed to make sure that technology meets our privacy policy. So in our view, a good privacy policy is based in, those, in these two elements. And the main purpose of the policy is to define the standards of how to assess that risk and what it means in practice to protect privacy. And this is exactly how we've tried to design a governance framework for privacy in the city. Um, so we see this in three stages. First, the city's privacy principles affirm our commitment to privacy and our privacy values. Second, the council privacy policy before you today aims to take those values and translate them into concrete standards that could be used to assess and implement privacy across the city. And then lastly, during the implementation phase of the work, um, we anticipate that staff would take those standards and define administrative policy to create the specific processes and procedures to apply those standards. In developing the policy before you today, we focused on adapting the GDPR framework to San Jose. Uh, and the policy uh, is primarily the, the output of three main inputs. Uh, the first is uh, case studies of other cities, uh, notably Seattle and Dublin, who have privacy programs that are based on GDPR. The second input uh, has been the, city, the city's privacy advisory task force, which is comprised of local leaders from the nonprofit industry, technology industry, government, business, and law enforcement, who've been an invaluable source of advice and feedback. And the third is stakeholder engagement and outreach to city departments. Those inputs uh, have helped develop a policy containing these uh, four main items. Um, and these are really the standards and framework for how we'd implement privacy across the city. Uh, first and foremost, it defines categories of PII, which we talked about at the beginning of this presentation. It creates the standards for assessing privacy risk and protecting personally identifiable information. The policy directs the creation of GDPR-based procedures for assessing risk, uh, which we just talked about. And lastly, the policy creates an initial governance structure and authority within the city manager's office to carry out this direction. So what are the standards um, that are at the core of this policy. You'll see them here. Uh, these are the standards that we would apply across the city to projects, technologies, and systems that contain PII. These specific standards uh, were developed in consultation with our Privacy Advisory Task Force and reflect what we consider to be the most important elements 
of protecting privacy. We are recommending that this committee cross-reference this item to the full council for approval of the city's first digital privacy policy. Before closing, we also wanted to take a few moments to discuss potential next steps for implementation should council approve the policy. Should council approve the policy, um, staff proposes using the time between approval and the end of our fiscal year for implementa implementation planning and budgeting. Uh, we recommend this for two reasons. Uh, first, uh, as we mentioned uh, earlier in this presentation, staffing for privacy work is currently minimal and there are no staff who are fully allocated to this work. Uh, so this planning period will allow for staff to propose and for council to consider staffing and funding options for privacy work as part of the next fiscal year's budget. Second, and importantly, uh, and as we've talked about before, uh, the outlook at the federal and state level for privacy policy is still uncertain. Uh, and so giving us the time to observe uh, what uh, uh, continued or next administration does on the, on the privacy policy front will be helpful in understanding how the city should adjust its approach accordingly. During this planning process, uh, we anticipate three priorities, uh, which you can see on the slide. The first two we've already talked about uh, at length in this presentation, uh, but we did want to mention that as part of this planning process, um, we do anticipate a community outreach and education process uh, to more deeply educate residents, understand community concerns, and understand um, how to prioritize uh, implementation moving forward. This is uh, work that we began in March uh, before COVID started with our nonprofit partner, Civic Makers. Um, and is already funded through a rebudget of those original funds. Um, and so we'd anticipate continuing that work to inform the design of our implementation moving forward. And as we enter this planning phase, uh, we think it's important to note the lessons of case studies like Seattle and Dublin regarding the level of effort required for implementation of a citywide privacy policy. Each of these two cities, which we consider to be some of the leaders in privacy have four full-time staff devoted to their privacy programs, in addition to additional resources at the departmental level to carry out implementation. And the lesson we took from each of these cities is that implementation of a privacy policy is a heavy lift and it must be planned for and budgeted by any city undertaking a comprehensive privacy policy. We wanna note that we are not asking a committee or council to make any budget decisions at this time, but we did want to preview the implications of potential conversations during the budget process for 2021, 2022. And at a high level, we envision three potential levels of service enabled by different levels of funding. At existing funding levels, meaning no full-time privacy staff, uh, existing staff would be able to implement a reactive privacy posture, uh, meaning we could respond to the highest priority privacy risks, but little else, this, this would be a minimal posture. At partial funding levels, we'd be able to be more responsive, uh, meaning implementation of the policy across more of the city and help to more departments, uh, but still not um, what would be possible at full funding akin to Seattle or Dublin, where we'd be able to take a proactive posture and uh, make proactive investments in processes and technologies to protect privacy across the city. To inform committee and council at this time, we've preliminarily scoped what we considered it to be the funding likely required for each of these scenarios um, to do three main tasks, uh, to assess privacy risk, to secure systems and technologies, and to respond to privacy requests, concerns, and engagement from our community. The, bold and the bolded items in each column represent uh, new funding that would be required, which for the responsive privacy posture is estimated to be approximately 500,000, and for the proactive privacy posture, estimated to be a million dollars annually. These are preliminary estimates and we will refine them over the course of the planning process, but we felt it important to share with council and the community at this time to help align expectations moving forward. So as an immediate next step, we recommend uh, as discussed that committee cross-reference the policy for approval at full council. Uh, and should council approve the policy, we expect uh, to move forward with the planning phase uh, on the following timeline. Um, and to report back to Smart Cities Committee as part of the January to June 2021 work plan. Uh, and we would also anticipate uh, including funding options for council consideration as part of the 2021-2022 budget discussions. 
we'll end with uh, a reminder of our North Star. Um, and uh, before we close, I do want to thank uh, the many staff who did a lot of heavy lifting to get us to this point. Um, Kip already mentioned Sarah Papazaglakis, uh, our senior privacy, former senior privacy policy analyst, uh, without whose dedication and passion, we definitely would not be here today. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge uh, Sarah Zarate from the city manager's office and uh, Jay Guevara, formerly of the civic innovation team and now deputy director in public works, uh, who lent um, their amazing and spirited leadership to get this effort off the ground. So with that gratitude and appreciation, I will hand it back to Rob. And taking this one, or do you have something, Rob? Yeah, so just a couple of things very quickly, and we'll turn, turn it over to you uh, on the committee and the, and the community. Um, you know, this is this is one of the pieces of work actually that we've accelerated. This was originally scheduled for January, and we were able to pull it forward because we were able to carve out some space to work on this to get this uh, bring this policy to you for your recommendation. Um, as you can see, implementation is going to be a heavy lift. I, I just kind of want to bottom line why we've gone with with GDPR, which is a, a bit of an alphabet soup. What we wanted was what, what's something that, that matches our principles, but people are, are likely to already be doing and already understand. And since GDPR is the framework that the European Union has adopted, any large tech company, any tech company, large or small, that has a global market is already figured out or, uh, how to be GDPR compliant. And so what that does is it gives us a way of saying this is what's important to us without necessarily uh, overly limiting the number of tech partners that could, we could work with. If we had a purely bespoke, this is what San Jose wants and only San Jose wants, we'd be at risk of not being able to work with uh, the large number of tech partners that we want to. By choosing an existing policy that works at scale uh, uh, with the European Union, we're able to say, this is what we want. And uh, anybody who's already in the global market will un both understand that and ideally have already built their systems in a way that can be compliant with it. So we're trying to leverage uh, the good work of uh, our European partners in this case to make something that works for San Jose in the absence of a national policy. And as Andrew said, we'd much rather have this solved at a national level um, or even a state level. But without that, we really felt we needed to move forward to make sure that personal and identifiable information as we move toward a smarter city is, is and the protection of that is taken extremely seriously. So with that, I'll close uh, and hand it back over to the committee and the community. All right, thank you, uh, Kip. First, we'll go to public comment. Um, Mr. Beekman, go ahead, two minutes. Hi, this is the love and life of my, the love of my life at this time. Uh, so, so thank you for this item. Uh, to begin, uh, Rob Lloyd, you know, mentioned that this these ideas are separate from uh, from technology practices of the city. That is going to be something we have to very much consider for our future that I don't think is going to be our philosophy for the future. Uh, you talked about the human rights issues of this, uh, of these things. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's a really good start. And you want to use the GDPR. Kip has always talked about the GDPR. And, you know, so you do have good ideas. Um, but, you know, human rights is kind of an international way to talk about uh, technology uh, uh, civil protection issues. In this country, we use the terms civil protections and civil rights. And that is like kind of illegal and banned by yourselves because basically what Rob Lloyd said from the beginning, you are basing your technology on capitalist practices and how to make money and, and what is the next greatest innovation with technology itself. When instead you guys could be practicing accountable practices, civil rights and civil protection ideas those are the ideas that brings a community together. And I think the community would be incredibly excited to be working on such a project. They would be talking to you regularly and we regularly would be having, you know, intelligent debate about the process of this country and exactly what is this country. And we're talking about our tech in terms that are safe and responsible and making it a safe process to talk about the future of our country you know, in terms of civil rights, in terms of civil protections. And that ends up becoming a great export to the rest of the world. That's the great American export. That is incredible stuff. And for you guys to totally negate that again and again, like you did at the beginning of this uh, item, it hurts. You know, uh, I have more to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Mr. Dodge.
Hi, um, my name is uh, Ethan Gregory Dodge and I'm from a group uh, called the Citizens Privacy Coalition of Santa Clara County. First off, I, I got a couple things to get through, but I want to applaud uh, the city for, for, uh, for making an effort to, to adopt a privacy policy. It's extremely important. Um, I, I have a few questions. Um, just how will the lack of funding for the privacy depart, uh, department uh, affect the implementation of a smart city? Um, if the future depart, uh, privacy is, funding is uncertain, um, it makes me concerned that all the data being collected by the smart city um, isn't going to have proper oversight and, and, and whatnot. So um, I, I feel like it may be irresponsible to continue with the smart city implementation without proper privacy oversight. Additionally, um, I, I don't know if this is, if what I'm, uh, the next two points I'm about to bring up, if the privacy policy is the most appropriate place to, to insert them. Um, and if they're not, if it's not, I apologize, but I wanted to get them on the public record anyway. Uh, it, the privacy policy doesn't address sharing data with law enforcement uh, with the implementation of, sm of the smart city coming in. I, 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 uh, um, I'm worried that just without restrictions of sharing that data with law enforcement, we would be en enabling mass surveillance on the citizens of San Jose um, via all the technologies that we're implementing through the smart city. And then also um, our organization, we uh, very soon we're going to start doing a push to ban facial recognition surveillance uh, by every law enforcement agency in the county. Um, so you'll be hearing me from me about that in other meetings and whatnot. Um, but I wanted to know, get the council's opinion to see if they thought that this privacy policy would be an appropriate place to, um, to address facial recognition or if it would be appropriate elsewhere. Um, thank you for, for the time. All right, thank you. Uh, we have one more public speaker, uh, the person ending, phone number ending in 5140. Yeah, I, I, I have a hard time believing that uh, you're not gonna be scaring things with law enforcement, you're not gonna get rid of facial recognition software. The city's have lied before, you guys, well, it's all you do is lie. I mean, for years, law enforcement said they didn't have ticket quotas. And then come to find out they did, thanks to the Freedom of Information Act. San Jose PD being one of the lying law enforcement organizations. Uh, and now if you tell a cop they have quotas, they tell you, we don't do that anymore. That means they used to do it, but when they were doing it, they lied to you. And as for cameras and everything, the city gives $100 or whatever for you to have a camera. You catch somebody breaking into your house. They don't, they don't even want to see the, the footage because they're, they're, they're understaffed to try to prosecute. I mean, you know, you call up uh, 911 uh, or 311 to report a crime, and you have uh, a lot of data on somebody, and uh, they'll tell you, you know, over the phone that uh, the DA won't prosecute, so they don't need, need to send somebody out. So, you know, you have all these wonderful ideas about copying Europe and how they do things, and that's wonderful. But when the rubber meets the road, the staffing, everyone's lazy at the city, right? I mean, it, you guys aren't going to be able to control the data. You know, they've never been able to control data. It, it's too big. And I, I don't trust it in the law. Uh, enforcement people's hands. They're 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 losers. Right? They 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 lose evidence. They lose everything. They don't know what they're doing. They don't. They can't use the technologies that they have. You guys you guys are wasting time time and money. You need to get back to like real uh, person to person contact with with fixing things, and the, patrolling the city. Uh, Fixing roads. This, this could be. Uh, right, thank people you. Get all... Sir, time's up. Um, we'll return to my colleagues on the council. Would anybody like to comment on this? I'm sure their comments. Go ahead, Mayor Licardo. Uh, thanks, Councilor Diep. And uh, really big thank you um, to Andrew, Marcelo, uh, Kip, everybody on the team, first for accelerating this work. I, I know this is a very difficult time to be talking about accelerating work, but it uh, really is one of those things that is uh, foundational to so much more that we want to do uh, in our city. And I think it's foundational also for a lot of external stakeholders, foundations, and others who can help us fund that work. 
And so being able to have this uh, in place, I think is awfully important. So thank you for, for doing the work and, um, and accelerating it as you have. Just so I understand the, the five page council policy that's attached here, that is our, our privacy policy. At least that's what's proposed at this point. Um, and then there was a reference to an administrative pri privacy policy. What does this all look like? So this goes to council and then the administrative privacy, privacy policy you guys work on separately. How, how is that all kind of getting rolled out? Andrew, do you want to take that? Sure. Yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor, that's exactly right. So the council policy would be the city's policy and, and would lay out the standards that we would apply. And then the, the administrative policy uh, really lays out the, the process steps, uh, basically like how we would implement risk assessments, data protection impact assessments, uh, and the exact steps that would, that would be gone through and um, which uh, offices and departments on the administrative side would be responsible for carrying those out. So it's really uh, the, the council policy is sort of the, the what, uh, and then the administrative policy would be the how we do it. How, yeah. And do we have to have both the what and the how done before we can say we have a privacy policy? Or can we at least say we have checked the box of having a policy with the what? <laughs> Yeah, I would say two things. One is it's it. I want to make it clear that it's it's not like we're flying without any privacy policy at the moment, right? So we have yeah. we have an overall way that we approach making sure that uh, PII is 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 secure, both from a cybersecurity and from a privacy standpoint. So this is really strengthening that. Uh, some individual departments have particularly strong individual privacy uh, policies, such as the library. Um, so what I would say is this gives us the the approval of this by the full council will give us formally a privacy a full overarching digital privacy policy for the first time, um, and then we will uh, can rapidly follow up as again somewhat dependent on funding with making sure that that, that is implemented across the board. So the the administrative policy is really the implementation um, uh, of it. Uh, the uh, council decision would be the creation of the policy. So I, I think we check that box, but with the realization yeah. that there's there's hard work to be done to make sure it's implemented and implemented well. I see. Thanks, Cap. And then uh, to the reference by the uh, one of the members of the community who is particularly concerned about facial recognition software. I assume all that is swept up in the same PII policy about how we do or don't use personally identifying information. Right? Yes, and I think I think an example of that, the, what the framework that's proposed under this policy. Let's say, for example, there was a, a, a piece of technology that, that included facial recognition. That would be um, reviewed under the, the framework of the policy and potentially go through an impact assessment. And then we would make a recommendation or determination whether that met, met the principles and have a, a way of uh, documenting that and making that decision. And if it was um, a complex enough decision, if you will, or a controversial enough decision, we could bring that also back to council for you to weigh in on. So the idea is that uh, technologies like like that, which were, which were mentioned in facial recognition, would have to go through an intentional vetting and would have to be approved proactively rather than just sort of ad adopted without us thinking it through. So it's exactly those types of, of different technologies with privacy implications that we want to adopt this policy to make sure that we've, if we choose to do them, it's, it's because we have chosen to do that within a privacy framework. Great, thanks, Kip. Well, I um, I read the policy. I certainly support it. I know that we're going to learn a lot in the months and years ahead that will undoubtedly have us tweaking it uh, moving forward. But it's a great start. I'm glad uh, we got it rolling forward. So thanks, you guys. All right, um, Vice Mayor. Thank you, and uh, thank you for that report, um, uh, Kip. This is something that came came up a, a while ago when we first started this process, and and that was. Um, getting input from the ACLU. And I know you're a card carrying member of the ACLU. What, what happened with that? And well, good news. Uh, the ACLU is one of the members of our task force, um, as is the NAACP, as is the Marcula Center, um, as uh, are a number of, of great institutions, um, including um, some of the folks at Cisco who are experts, some folks that we have Stanford affiliations. Do we have a slide with the, all of the members on the task force, Andrew? 
if you could maybe pull that up while I'm I'm I'm, I'm talking. It's a so bottom line, uh, uh, Vice Mayor is uh, we have them as a a member that is advising us. It doesn't mean that necessarily everything that they would like is reflected in our policy, but they have had a real chance to be a part of advising us on that, and we have been working toward as best we can bringing forward a policy which which balances those different interests and really takes into account the issues, the very legitimate issues that that they've surfaced. With us, and I, I actually let my uh, uh, membership lapse partly because I didn't want to have a conflict of interest. So okay. I'm no longer a card carrying member. <laughs> so I'll retract that last part. But yeah. I know a while back they uh, I had a meeting with them, and they did uh, present to me um, some clearly defined um, privacy policies that they've already developed. And I just didn't know how much uh, we've uh, tapped into them and you know, incorporated some of that uh, that input. Yeah, you see the list here and, and Victor Sin, who has been extremely active and engaged with us since before we had this task force, is their representative and, and he's been a, a great conduit for us bringing, bringing forward a number of different issues, as well as uh, everybody that you see here from Stanford Law, Cisco, uh, San Jose State, you know, Marcula Center at, at Santa Clara, and then uh, Santa Clara County as well. I appreciate that. And then um, last is, I, I like to set up a briefing with uh, someone from your team to really do a deep dive on this because I have a real world uh, project that's moving forward right now and, and privacy issues and questions are, are coming up and I wanna overlay our new policy that we're proposing with the implementation of this, this project and see how we can reconcile some of those issues. Uh, I'd be delighted to, sir, and, and we'll take uh, take some time with you personally as well as members of the team to to debrief out and to uh, seek to understand on that. That'd be great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, I had one quick question on the the GDPR. I'm talking for out of memory, and my memory may be faulty on this, but I could have sworn that the state of California attempted to do something similar, but it didn't work out. Am I am I wrong on that? I would say. California's had a number of different debates around how they want to do privacy. As you know, the, the recent ballot measures also changed their privacy landscape, but they have not adopted something as comprehensive as, uh, or, uh, they have not gone to the measure of adopting GDPR. There were some discussions that I was, uh, had heard about at the state level of using a similar framework, but they've chosen so far not to go uh, with that approach. And, and I guess that was what I was kind of remembering. And the, the point being California did not go that route, although there was some discussion because something about European standards, for instance, like the right to be forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. There are some, there are some pieces where we're not, and this is the reason why we're not saying we are applying GDPR wholesale. Uh, there are some things within GDPR that, that, that would be difficult or almost impossible for us to do without a larger uh, larger adoption of GDPR at the state or the federal level, for example. Um, so uh, th uh, the right to be forgotten, which is both in GDPR and in many European laws, including very deeply in German law, uh, basically says, hey, take every ref reference you have out of me, uh, to me out of your records, period. That's not something that we have uh, recommended in this iteration going forward, uh, both because it doesn't it hasn't been a tight fit with the policy guidance that you've given us. And also it's a very technically complicated thing to do well. Sure, I, I, I'm supportive of the recommendation. Um, I guess I'll just, I'll just share my, we, we are the 10th largest city in America. I think, you know, in the same way, what happens in California shapes the rest of the country. I'm, I'm sure what happens in San Jose will shape the, 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 the ground for other cities across America, um, especially in an area where I think it's still developing. So to the extent that, that we lead on this, um, we will come, come up with a format for many other cities. Um, and I'm glad we should use that, uh, that power to do that. Um, I guess I'll just share a, a, a trepidation in the sense of, to the extent that Europeans set up high barriers with these sort of policies that perhaps may dissuade um, commerce to, to some degree. I, I hope we're sensitive to that when it comes to San Jose as well, because we're still trying to attract um, employers. And, and I know Google's coming, so we're well aware of that. But uh, to the extent that we set up standards that are so high and so perfect, um, it creates difficulties. That's just something to 
No, I, I agree. And, you know, I first began discussing GDPR in 2012 uh, when I was in PayPal. And so, you know, fintech in general is, is very concerned about that type of regulation and understanding them. And, and I think as I've watched it, not as part of PayPal anymore, but watched it from this side of things, what I've seen is by and large, tech companies have been able to comply with GDPR. It hasn't always been easy for them, uh, but it hasn't, uh, it hasn't shut down uh, FinTech or other companies from, from being able to operate within the European context and, uh, and respect privacy. But it is certainly something that we keep an eye on. And actually part of the reason that we want GDPR rather than making something up that might inadvertently drive every, every potential partner away. Perfect. Okay. Well, with that, uh, can we get a motion along with, and can that motion also include a cross-reference of this report to the full council in December? So moved. Second. All right. On the motion. Jimenez. Yes. Davis. Aye. Ricardo. Aye. Jones. Aye. Yeah. Aye. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, now on to the next item, uh, city website and digital services update. Uh, Rob. Missed my mute button. Uh, digital strategy has become a necessity and the urgency has increased with COVID-19 turning us into a virtual organization. But this moves also beyond traditional and simpler online engagement approaches and, and pushing information. It's now about service delivery. It's about using online and mobile and phone and bot channels, whatever's the most comfortable to our community um, and the different portions of our community. There's also an aspect of, of automation. So with that, um, Jerry's, uh, Jerry, uh, Kelly, um, and Trevor and Matt are gonna present that item. Uh, but Kip, I think you also wanted to add an item um, on slide two. Or not. Jerry, why don't you go ahead? Sure, I can jump in on this. So this slide here is just to take us back uh, in a little bit of a uh, time journey on our digital strategies and uh, launching of the website. So. I uh, want to remind the committee that version 1.0 of My San Jose was launched with five services in July of 2017. Also in July of 2017, the city signed a contract with Vision Internet to redesign and replatform the city's website, sanjoseca.gov. And after many challenges, uh, the city uh, launched the new website in November 2019, setting the stage for a much improved digital front door for the city, uh, which Matt uh, Opsel will talk about in a minute. So today we're going to cover uh, a little bit of the, the extended part of this journey. So in the past, uh, of course, we, we are going to talk about uh, the successes since uh, the launch of San Jose the redesigned version of that, and how that positioned us for COVID-19. Of course, uh, we're still in COVID-19, um, but the new website redesign helped position us well uh, for dealing with the pandemic. We're going to talk about uh, the present and uh, the Powered by People effort and, and how that plays in into safely reopening city services. And then lastly, we're going to talk about the future and, and our envisioning of future um, internal and external digital strategies and, and the partners that we have on board to help us uh, get our digital strategies right. So first up, uh, we're gonna have Matt Abs Absol uh, talk to us about uh, our website journey. Thank you, Jerry. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Honorable Mayor, committee members, staff, and public. My name is Matt Opsel, Senior Executive Analyst for the City Manager's Office of Communications. My main focus is website administration and digital content. We launched the reimagined digital front door for the City of San Jose, the City website, during the final weekend of November 2019. This was no simple task. Growing the team from two people in 2017 and 2018 to over a dozen dedicated team members in 2019 required a project reset. The web team for launch consisted of members from the Office of Communications, the Office of Civic Innovation, the Information Technology Department, and a dedicated support team from the website vendor. In the lead up to launch, the web team collaborated with over 130 web publishers and editors from every city department. This launch was a thematic shift that transformed the experience for residents and visitors alike using a responsive design resulting in a quality user experience no matter the device used. We focused on a customer-centric approach organized by how users search for answers and how we can best help them find those very answers. 
This approach enables employees to improve service delivery to residents, businesses, and visitors. We continue to maintain accessibility compliance with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, and our outreach has been enhanced with a modern newsroom featuring a dynamic, integrated presentation of news releases, department information updates, as well as a blog for promoting city services, programs, and highlights. The website is one of the city's most powerful tools to keep communities informed and engaged. Since launch, we've enhanced the internal search engine and improved the backend infrastructure with the website vendor. We have enabled multi-factor authentication for increased security, added an uh, Instagram social widget, connected to the city's YouTube account for easy access to public meeting broadcasts, developed and shared virtual training sessions and updated best practice guides and guidelines for city web publishers and editors, and have integrated the resident assistant chatbot pilot onto the website. I'd now like to introduce Trevor Gould, my peer in the Office of Communications, to go over an update on website analytics. Trevor, over to you. Thanks so much, Matt. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Honorable Mayor, committee members, staff, and of course the public. Uh, my name is Trevor Gould. I am also a senior executive analyst for the City Manager's Office of Communications, and my main focus areas are analytics, digital marketing, and general communications. Um, we wanted to briefly touch upon some of the high level key performance indicators for our website for 2020 so far. So naturally we'll start with uh, website visitation and page visits. Up to this point, we have at this point surpassed 4.8 million total page visits. And that has already eclipsed all of our website traffic from 2019, which was roughly four and a half million. In terms of the top five pages of 2020, you can see them listed here. I mean, the home page makes sense from a common sense perspective. Emergency notifications make sense from a contextual standpoint, given everything we've been through this year. And three through five, frankly, just speaks to the fact that animals are indomitable in terms of their appeal uh, to the general public. Um, next, we have uh, mobile visitation. And as of so far this year, mobile devices constitute 40% of total web page traffic. And that's up 8% from 2019. Now, we're excited about this because Matt previously alluded to responsive design, which was one of the major key tenants for our reimagined digital front door and directly contributes to a great user experience, particularly on mobile devices. So we are happy to see this uptick in terms of total percentage of website traffic. And actually, if you're just looking at it from a raw traffic perspective from mobile devices, we're up 26% year over year from last year to this year. So we're, we're very excited about that development. Um, next, we all know them, we have our emergency pages. They served as one of the many foundations for our ongoing response to COVID and um, all the other um, local emergencies we've dealt with this year. They've received over 500,000 visits, 58,000 of which were to the translated pages, so slightly over 10%. Um, additionally, Matt and I looked into the metrics and Google Translate has been used nearly 2,500 times. Um, it's not up here, but it's important to note that we were taking a dive into which web pages um, users spent the most time on. And we are very happy to see that our virtual local assistance center pages ranked the second highest for the city. The average user spends four minutes and 40 seconds there, which means not only, of course, do they find the page, but they stay for the resources the, and the information. And so that was really reassuring and something we were happy to find out. Um, finally, we all know them. There are flasher points. We've sent out 1.6 million of them. That M is correct. Um, we're happy because we have enjoyed an average open rate percentage of 45%. And that's about 20% the government industry standard. And in the process, we've managed to accrue 4,000 additional subscribers. So we're happy that we've sent out a lot of these, but they continue due to their the relevancy of the information to resonate with our um, with our population and help us gain new followers in the process. So feel free to run it. Um, we are, there we go, you think you can hit uh, play. We brought back the racing bar chart graph. This essentially is going to demonstrate cumulative web page visitation from 2016 to present. So I'm just gonna be quiet and let it run. And as you can see, it's no uh, 
coincidence that the emergency notifications page has vaulted into the top 10 there this year due to the fact they've received so much traffic. Um, without further ado, I'd actually like to hand it back to Matt so Matt can give some credit where credit is more than due. Uh, back to you, Matt. Thank you very much, Trevor. We've come a long way, but our work has just started on the digital front door for the city of San Jose. We will continue to collaborate and help support the Emergency Operations Center, or EOC, and the Emergency Public Information Office, or EPIO, in the city's COVID-19 response and recovery. We'd like to take a quick moment to thank all of the EOC and EPIO team members we have worked with so far. There have been long days and hours, and we would not have been able to accomplish this great work without their dedication and passion to help residents. We will also continue to work alongside the website vendor and support city departments, including web publishers and web editors, while we iterate, improve, and enhance the experience provided by the city's digital front door. We look forward to working with the Powered by People 2.0 group and contributing to their greater work plan. I'd now like to hand it over to Kelly Parmley, who will speak more on Powered by People 2.0. Wow, thank you, Matt and Trevor. Um, that's a really powerful foundation in terms of describing how far we've come with that digital front door. Um, and so my job is to uh, help elevate uh, the role of people uh, in this. And it may be curious to many of you how we're talking about technology and how Jerry in a few minutes is gonna talk about alignment of, of internal and external strategies that, that I come here and talk about. Um, how important it is to invest in our people as part of the equation. And so the point here of this slide is, is really to highlight um, that part of the success or the recipe for success when we're talking about digital transformation is that we have to put people in the mix along with process and technology. I often say to folks that we could take the approach of build it and they will come. And in fact, if we don't have our workforce and our folks uh, uh, trained in some mindsets and some tools and technologies and um, ways of working together, um, that digital transformation may actually not uh, occur as well or as at scale as we would like. So in the next slide, um, this is one that I'm sure will resonate with many of you who've spent any time in organizations and that culture eats strategy for breakfast and technology for lunch and then a whole bunch of other things. And um, I think to translate that in, in some ways, um, Number one, we have a, a large number of folks in our city, if you think about it, who've been in the city for some time and may not have uh, not only the mindsets, but the skills and experiences uh, to support the kind of transformation that we're talking about. And so how do we actually invest in the development of the next generation of leaders? Um, having spent 15 years as an administrator in public higher education, I was often mystified that um, many of our graduates did not come out with these mindsets and skill sets. Um, to be able to support this kind of work. And so as an HR person, I care deeply about making sure we invest in our, our employees to be successful with what our folks in civic innovation and IT want to accomplish. I think the second one, um, in terms of fostering a culture of change, um, is it's not uncommon uh, in any organization. I've learned from large private sector colleagues, as well as folks in um, bureaucratic government settings, that oftentimes we do not empower staff uh, to make the changes or to be able to champion and lead changes in how we do things. That often phrase of that's we've done it this way and it hasn't broken and it's it's working just fine is, is certainly one of those. But what I've come around to notice, particularly with the one pilot I'll say I'll speak to in a in a moment, is that um, oftentimes the empowerment is literally giving them permission to do it, but more importantly um, is to be able to arm them with the skills, the mindsets, and the support of their uh, leadership uh, to do this. So fostering that culture is really important. The last thing is, is that um, in any situation, whether we're talking about technology, new technology, using technology to do more and exciting things and innovation, any amount of problem solving that we can bring to the table with our folks, whether it involves technology or not, is really, really important as a foundation. And I think that's been illustrated significantly in the work through the EOC and our, our taking opportunities during the pandemic to move things forward. Um, and, and what we need to do in terms of the next level is to, to move to this area uh, more broadly and at scale around what's called human-centered design, which I'll describe in just a second. So. Um, on the next slide, um, pretty soon, um, y'all might get a little tired of seeing Powered by People 2.0. So um, I, I hope you're not, because it's really exciting to us. Um, but I want to speak to the, the last two objectives in Powered by People 2.0, super important. Um, 
this drive to digital and effective teams is a, a great partnership between HR and IT. Um, I have immense uh, respect for, but also a great uh, sense of being collaborative with, with IT. And, um, and for me, that's really important because as we have transitioned 40% of our workforce overnight uh, to working remotely, Another 40% continue to work in the field and about 20% are working in a city facility. That means we are grappling with challenges around working with dispersed teams. And so what do we need to support our employees to do the things that we want to have happen uh, in digital ways with our community, with our residents, and um, also in service of our employees? So I think um, in thinking about that and coming up with a vision for where we might go, we actually are building on the work um, that we started with civic innovation pre-COVID, which almost makes me weep because we were on the on the cutting edge of about to launch uh, an innovation learning lab to support, support our small wonders projects. And so what we have done is grabbed a hold of that concept and the work that we did then and retooled it to see what we can do um, in a different way. So on the last slide here that I'll show you um, is that we have um, partnered with civic majors, which you heard Eric, uh, Andrew, oh my goodness, I said it, I knew I would. Andrew, Eric, <laughs> um, uh, mentioned in terms of the, the privacy work, but they're also an incredible partner in working with people to develop the skill sets uh, and, and, the, um, and the mindset actually about embracing a new way of um, taking our government services and thinking about our residents and how might we understand about doing work with them as opposed to um, for them. And so this idea essentially with human centered design is it's about problem solving and bringing um, a research approach and a methodology that would allow us to deeply understand who it is that we serve. Um, so we're working on a twofer here, um, two things, um, a pilot of about 15 people, six intensive sessions, including what's called a demo day. So it's slightly scaled down from a, like a small wonders project would be um, including three sessions with executive staff to help build that leadership sort of mindset around human-centered design, but also um, building the cap capabilities and capacities and mindsets of 15 people. So what did we do? Um, we actually said, well, we know that our employees need more and our intranet, our website, um, SharePoint wasn't serving them well enough to be able to both be engaged as well as have the tools and things on demand in order to serve in this new dispersed environment. So in order to test out how to bring them skills um, that would be uh, useful in a digitally transformation way, um, but also um, see if we could get some research on what it is employees actually need. We've combined those two into three teams who are looking at those very questions of how might we create an engaged and informed workforce how might we optimize virtual productivity and how might we create a unified digital workspace? And so um, that's what they're going through. The human centered design approach is there. And I would say it's a design with and not for the end users. So they're actually asking employees, what is it that you need uh, in order to be successful and be able to serve well? Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jerry who will actually connect the humans to what they're, they're uh, coming up with from alignment of uh, external and internal digital strategies. Thank you, Kelly. So envisioning future digital strategies requires both an internal and external focus. Our staff need new or different tools to meet new and different expectations. For our internal tools, we need to think about the processes and technologies our staff and teams need in our new hybrid environment. We need common tools for promoting employee engagement and keeping them informed in a culture of remote work. We need to provide easy access to the systems they need to do their jobs. And we need to promote or an organizational culture that resonates as one across the city to focus on amazing customer experience, no matter what door our customers walk through. For external tools, we need high standards for accessibility and language translation. We need consistent user experience and foundational technologies, and we need prioritized digital services based on the needs of our residents creating a common, and in the middle, you can see that we need to also create a common culture uh, so that the expectations, both internally, mirror those externally and in reverse. So an inside outlook and an outside in look. In the end, our digital strategy will support our external objectives, informed and engaged residents, amazing customer service, no matter what door they come through, and inclusive access. 
To quote a recent Harvard, uh, Harvard Business Review article on digital transformation, success requires bringing together and coordinating a far greater range of effort than most leaders appreciate. A poor showing in any of the four interrelated domains, technology, data, process, or, or organizational change capability can scuttle an other, otherwise well-conceived transformation. This is a big lift and we need to move fast and, and we, and we know there will be a resource ask, which will make, uh, make its way through our budget process. So I want to introduce one of our partners um, is Lonnie Ingram, who's uh, from the Harvard Business School Community Partners. Who and Lonnie is uh, is has got a lot of experience and background in Smart Cities Initiative, and she actually uh, started the Smart C Cities Business Area uh, for Verizon. So Lonnie. Hi there, thank you so much, Gary. And um, you know, we really appreciate the opportunity to introduce the HBS Community Partner um, Partnership with the city. Uh, we're very excited to work on this digital transformation strategy and also to work very closely with this particular City of San Jose team. Um, so we started off by actually assembling a really strong team. And um, one of the things that I wanted to do first is to take just an extra minute to uh, introduce some of those members. Um, so we've got uh, Nikki Santos, who's an educator. Um, she is very focused on evolving global workforce around innovation strategy and really kind of training that next lit set of leaders. She's a member of the UC Merced Innovation and Entrepreneurship Lab. And she's also worked with the city of San Jose before um, working on the Silicon Valley Talent Partnership. Um, David O'Reilly has joined us um, with a very strong amount of experience in um, leading digital healthcare and life sciences companies. He's currently the co-founder and CEO of Dyad Therapeutics which is focused on Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders. Um, Rethnika Prasad is very focused on environmental issues. Um, she's got uh, a, a role with the uh, energy, uh, leading the energy strategy at the Environmental Defense Fund. And uh, she's working towards a net zero emissions uh, capability. She also was a consultant at Bain. And uh, in addition to being from HBS has a master's um, from the Kennedy School of Government. Um, and then lastly, we have Carlos, who has a very strong passion around um, tech enabling communities, focusing on health and also socioeconomic inclusion. Um, he's currently a product manager at Google, but he was um, also a consultant at McKinsey and uh, is really focused on digital transformation engagements in both Latin America and Canada. So we get a little bit of a different experience there. Um, so on the next page, really what we're trying to focus on here is making sure that we have a, um, a view of what HBS can do to focus on the external side of the objectives while partnering very closely with the People by People 2.0 initiative to ensure the internal city employees have the ability to service the residents in the most effective manner. So our focus is gonna be on that orange box on the very top um, of that last slide. Um, and really trying to be able to focus on a few key things. Um, so one is um, doing an as-is analysis so that we can gather information on what is done today, um, gathering the city goals, what their objectives are, and really understanding what the areas of opportunity is. Second thing is to focus on how residents want to consume the city of San Jose services. This is the bulk of the work. Um, we're gonna be leveraging input from you and others that you will point us to within the organization who know the community's needs the best. We will focus on looking at community personas and digital surveys to make sure that we gain the resident's perspective um, with focus questions on this particular effort. And then lastly, we're gonna be brainstorming on digital strategies from other cities, both in the US and globally. I'll be tapping into my network on this and we'll be getting both best practices and also lessons learned. And then lastly, we'll pull it all together with the ability to see a 2B view, uh, an art of the possible, so to speak. Again, keeping the residents' needs in mind first and then partnering very closely with the internal teams to make sure that the employees do have the ability to execute on this because um, these two things are kind of operating as two sides of the same coin. Um, so with that, Jerry, I'll give it back to you. 
Thank you, Lonnie. Uh, we are also, as you point out, that in, in conjunction with the Harvard work, we are also taking a product project management approach to this so we can uh, make sure that the efforts uh, and the work of Harvard uh, are built into our approach and sustainable uh, long term. And in the end, our digital strategy will support our external objectives, informed, engaged residents, amazing customer experience, um, and inclusive access. And I mentioned I mentioned already that this will be a sizable lift and we're creating a multidisciplinary team, both from the internal perspective with some of the work with uh, Powered by People and Civic Makers who's working with us on the learning labs and also with uh, the Harvard uh, Business School community partners. We also are partnering with, uh, with the website uh, folks, Trevor and Matt, and starting to develop approaches to governance and, and some of the policies that we're going to need to address. All of that is going to take um, an immense amount of time and effort and will require some dollars as we start to move into optimizing technologies and, and, and working on our foundations that we need. So we, I'll say again that um, uh, the, the purpose of the Harvard work is to help us um, get a consistent strategy and also uh, get an estimate of what the size of the effort is going to be. I'm now going to turn it over to Rob for closing uh, comments. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, uh, Kelly. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Matt, on all that uh, good work. You know, the overview of the journey that we've been on and that uh, My San Jose launched in 2017, the website launched in 2019, and all this significant work um, aims actually at our next agenda item, too, or at least interfaces with our agenda item uh, for the IT strategic plan. Um, so we are concluding our current IT strategic plan, and let me share that. Oops. Um, hey, Jerry, can you unshare? Rock on. And, and the course of, of direction that we got from uh, City Council in 2016 uh, was the smart city vision for San Jose um, and the goal to be the most innovative city in North America uh, by 2020. Uh, we since uh, tweaked that a little bit to say in 2020. Uh, and we do have uh, some hope to report some good stuff on that uh, in, in this month. But the, the direction of that plan was to set what is important to the city and where we wanted to go with technology so we could achieve the more colloquial term that we use, which was so that San Jose is as innovative as the community we serve. And in the course of that, we had three pieces to it. One was the um, Smart City Roadmap. One was the uh, Small Wonders, which was the experimentation that uh, Jerry and, and Kelly and others talked about. And the other was the IT strategic plan proper, which was how we matured our, our IT platforms, our services, our culture to be able to support everything that the city wanted to do. Council had, back then had said, we need IT not to be a back office solution, but a strategic asset and partner to the organization. So all that work sufficed into this one page IT strategic plan summary where we had some key metrics. We said, these are the things we're gonna focus on. And in six, we said, um, here's a couple of initiatives that council said are especially important to it at the time and some underlying assumptions that we had. We also came up with a game board of all the things that we would then need to do over the next three years, which became four um, as we added in the new priorities over the course of that plan. That's a good thing and it's, it's, it's fine um, because we practice kind of agile strategic planning here, realizing every year priorities can change. Um, the community can need different things and council can ask for a different set of focus. Um, and uh, over the course of hours, for example, uh, we had uh, access side digital inclusion. We had a couple uh, natural disasters to contend with, a pandemic. So all those things shaped what we were able to accomplish. But in, in sum, on the measures that we said were going to be important to us, we were able to drastically increase customer satisfaction. The project success rate for IT um, increased dramatically. IT reliability hit its 99.9% .9 uptime where previously we were declining because of a lot of tech debt. Um, our employee engagement um, tripled and our core budget, which we set the goal of three to 5%, we we're at least able to close to double. Um, our expired hardware drastically reduced and the vacant positions that council, I remember when I did my interview said, this is really um, an important topic to us because of the attrition and, and vacancy rates. Uh, even with a hiring freeze uh, this past year, we had a 14% uh, vacancy rate. So drastically able to, to uh, improve those metrics. 
But what we're doing now is we're actually setting our approach for the next three years, and, and maybe less depending on how much variability we see ahead of us. But we wanna go through the process of what we're gonna do. Um, and at the end of this, we actually have a few key questions for council committee uh, to help us shape how we're gonna approach the, the planning process that we have for the strategic plan and all the inputs that are gonna help us define what we, we are going to do. Um, the key first couple steps are we set the assessment and say, what is the lay of the city uh, and the state of the city? Uh, we talk about some strategies that unify those needs. So we're not um, dealing with things as uh, reactionary or one-off items, but we try to coalesce all the needs across the city into some clear directions. We incorporate a lot of input um, from departments, from the city manager's office and their priorities, from council, from outside experts, so that we can really form a good plan, challenge it, but have, have something we can take forward with a lot of confidence. And then there's the resourcing of that, which is how do we optimize the resources of the organization to support all the things that we say we're going to do and that we say are important to us. Um, on the inputs piece, here's what we talk about when we say there's a lot of, of stuff that comes into this planning process. From this uh, city manager's office and departments, we have what the departmental needs are, where they need to take the departments um, that they lead. Uh, we have committee and council to tell us this is really where we need the city to be in, in two and in three and five years, and, and we need you to support that. We have some audits that inform our direction as well. Uh, there's some trends and risks in, in IT the, as an industry or even like privacy and, and other topical items. Um, in this case, we also have what, what uh, Jerry introduced with Lonnie, the digital, digital services push that's gonna be very definitive of our success, we believe in the next two and three years, um, especially right now, but it's gonna carry beyond. Um, and then we also have some IT advisory board input that we're going to assemble. assemble. We we're very fortunate to get some of the top leaders uh, in IT on our last one, and we'll aim to do the same thing, and then bring a consultant who has a lot of research and, and advisory services. All this is going to give us basically four products um, that we deliver to the committee um, and for council approval after that. Uh, one is the strategies and core metrics of, of what we're going to try to do and how. The other one is how we should organize the resources of IT to accomplish that best. How do we resource that in the context of the city and our budget uh, and what we see is, is the future and the forecast. Uh, and then the objectives and key results, how we're gonna manage that so we deliver the results like we have with success uh, in, in the past plan. Uh, here are a couple initial priorities and, and structural questions we already have. Uh, and this is based on things that we've discussed in the committee, uh, things that we've seen in the pandemic response and other items. But we do be, believe that there is gonna to have to continue to be that relentless focus on disaster preparedness and specifically how do we go from recovery, the response to recovery with a pandemic. And that's gonna be definitive of who we are for the, for the coming years. Equity is, is another question that we've heard loud and clear and how does technology and the platforms and, and, and what we can do for our employees support how IT is gonna help with the equity question. And then we have some core stuff around cybersecurity, the digital services we spoke about, and how data is gonna fuel how we work better in the future. And then along with that, there's some structural questions that say how do innovation and technology uh, blend and merge um, or, or, or continue as is, but, but we're gonna have to ask ourselves that identity question. There's the optimizing the city's resources, and, and, and this is especially key in IT strategic planning if resources are thin, Normally, you optimize differently than if you're resource rich and, and we can invest a lot into innovation practices. So we're going to have to find the right balance for the city of San Jose. Um, that ties to positions and funding and how we allocate costs, uh, kind of the minutia of it. Um, and then last is how do we accelerate the initiatives that we have and what we identify are the things that council and, and, and departments really need us to push on. So the, the flow that we're gonna go through is right now we're presenting the approach um, and that's November, 2020. Uh, from here and the, the feedback you give us and, and some um, prioritization that C, uh, city manager's office is doing, we're going to then uh, put that analysis and input together so we have an initial plan. From there, we'll get the feedback and refine it, plan approvals, uh, attach metrics, um, do the vetting process with um, the outside experts and our, our advisory. Uh, so that we can bring you, hopefully, um, in the first half of 2021, that plan for approval and then cross-reference to, to City Council. So that we can do the same thing and give you a very clear picture of what we're going to do with the IT in the next two or three years. Um, and Kip and I have had this discussion is normally we do a three-year strategic plan because that's as far as we can see out with technology. This one actually might be, end up being shorter because there's a lot of unknowns in that two to three-year window. 
Um, but the, the piece that we are asking for your feedback today uh, is we have three kind of definitive questions that will help us get started on the, on the right foot. Uh, and, and we would like council's feedback on this so we can incorporate it into the start of, of our planning process. Number one is, is what did the committee see in the IT strategic plan uh, that's just concluding that worked and did not work at a policy level? Um, and, and, and how would you give us some, some feedback on that? Another one is what the council's uh, committee council's um, appetite for high level change uh, would be. We've talked about over the last three, four years, how, how we can do technology oversight different, um, how policies might need to change, how we might need to refresh the demonstration policy, the innovation demonstration policy, purchasing acceleration and innovation, all those types of input, but, but please, please give us those uh, insights. And then if we can kind of do an Amazon type approach and, and do the vision at the end, at the beginning, uh, and ask you, if we're in 2013, and, and you could write one sentence about where San Jose, uh, describing San Jose innovation technology then, what would it be right now? What is that, that vision you would have for us? And, and so with that, we're, we're open to input. We would like um, uh, you know, your, your feedback on those questions, um, but um, that, that's it for our, our presentation portion. Rob, I think you might have gotten ahead of yourself just a little bit. We didn't oh. conclude the last item and we need oh. to. Oh, you're yeah. right. <laughs> so, um, so what I'd like to do is thank you for that preview. Um, <laughs> what we'll do is we'll, um, I'll, I'll just say one thing really quick and then we'll hand it back to you chair on the last item to take both public comment and then council discussion and any action on that. And then we will have given you uh, the total advance uh, preview of this one before we get going, but appreciate the enthusiasm, Rob. So the one, the one thing I wanted to add to the, the, the last presentation was um, uh, Lonnie, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call you out on this one. So all the Harvard team, all that great group that's assembled, how much are you all charging us for all that work? This is all on a volunteer basis. So we have, particularly focused on getting people who just have a very strong passion for improving our communities. We all live here. We all want it to be better. And so um, we just want to be able to see how we can help. Yeah, I just want to underscore that because this is this is the type of, of group that's a, really a dream team. Um, and for them to do it, not only at this high level of professionalism, um, but also to do it pro bono, as they say, is extraordinary. And, and, and Lonnie in particular, we're glad to have you leading this because you do understand the intersection of tech and service in a very, very deep way. And you also understand uh, San Jose. So uh, with that, we will conclude our previous presentation and turn it back over to you, uh, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll go first to public comment. Uh, Mr. Beekman, two minutes. Hi, I hope this means that we can still speak on the next item. Uh, thank you for this uh, item. It was very informative. I very much apologize that I was a bit overstrong in my uh, you know, last words. Uh, this has you know, some interesting ideas of, of love and uh, human care to it. Uh, you know, but it's with that that, you know, I, it has a denseness to it that, you know, I, I lack that about how to, how you talk as government about privacy policy and practices uh, with the community. And I'm sorry about that. I hope that I, my simplicity and my simple ideas can, can be a good example, a simple good example for yourselves as you're building something with a little more depth to it. And it's from that depth that, you know, you know, San Jose was building their privacy policies in the past and their cybersecurity policies um, that were not geared to engage the public. And what I was trying to say in my last item was that, you know, there's open public policy ideas that allow the public to be engaged with their community. And to me, that is just the idea of sustainability. And it just keeps asking ourselves, what are our better practices of ourselves? What are our more responsible practices of ourselves? And these ideas can work hand in hand with the future of corporate technology and the need for profit. It doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. And that's what I was trying to get at. Um, the UN, uh, the, at the UN this year, there were cybersecurity uh, issues that you know, the Eastern European, some Eastern European countries have really developed ideas to reach out to their community and make it an open shared process in actuality. Uh, 
Mayor, uh, Supervisor Samidian of Santa Clara County has developed, uh, you know, a surveillance and technology ordinance for that 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 addresses uh, exactly cybersecurity issues. It gives clear examples. Uh, good luck to yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Checking. No other public commenters. Returning to my colleagues, uh, Mayor Licardo. Go ahead, sir. Or maybe maybe the mayor's out for the moment. Um, do we have any Vice Mayor Jones? You want to go ahead? Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for um, the presentations. Um, I'll, let's start out. Uh, I'll start out with the. Um, the um, HBS team, I uh, want thank you uh, for um, volunteering your time and talents to uh, to work on this project. Uh, I'm going to take a shot, and this is not directed at you, Lonnie, and your team. It's directed at the mayor, and that is that got to see some more Berkeley Business School representation, or at least at the very least, a little bit of Stanford. But uh, I just want to get that out there. But I do appreciate your efforts. Thank you. The um, Rob on the um, in terms of what's been beating in my head is when I talk to my kids. You know, I used to just talk to them about making sure that they um, manage their credit card debt, but now I talk about their tech debt. And uh, your questions um, at the end of your presentation are um, very good questions, and I. I'd like to have an opportunity to really uh, think about them and, and get back to you with some really solid answers. But I just wanna tell you that uh, from where we were before in your presentation, where we're looking at your circles and where we're looking at a lot of red to where we are today is a, a testament to uh, the, the work and the heavy lifting that you've done. And uh, I've been very impressed. Obviously we have a, a long way to go uh, we've had some some issues in terms of uh, our technology and our infrastructure keeping up with the, the demands. And so that's obviously a concern for you and it's a concern for, for all of us. Uh, so at some point, we're going to have to make the tough decisions, obviously, in terms of how much are we able to invest and are willing to invest in giving you the resources that you need to accomplish your strategic objectives. Uh, I also want to comment on... Um, our people. And I know that uh, part of the presentation, there was a, a discussion about uh, fostering and developing uh, the next generation of leaders, but uh, also representing the older generation and the old timers. I wanna just uh, let us not forget that even the more experienced uh, employees or, or workers uh, have a lot of talent and, and innovation left in them. And we shouldn't forget that and try to nurture and foster that as well. So I just want to just get that out there to not overlook the employees that we've had in these positions for a long period of time who know our, the, cult, the existing culture, but can adapt and grow and, 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 and be part of the, the, new, the new culture and the new structure and the new uh, direction. So that's, that's my input. Thank you for the presentation. All right, thank you, Vice Mayor. Let me return to the, the mayor, see if he's ready to speak. I, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I had to jump on a phone call, my apologies. Sure, well, I could have stalled um, if you knew, <laughs> but okay. Yeah, thank you for doing that. Um, hey, first, just wanted to say a huge thank you to Rob and the entire team um, for what has been a really tremendous turnaround in, in about four or five years. We'll call you the Lee Iacocca of of IT, uh, I'm really showing my age here. But Lund smiled, so he still remembers. Uh, I, I, I do have a question though about the, can we go back to, I think it's slide seven that is the slide that relates to why people are accessing our digital front door, the website. And um, I think it's, this is the dynamic uh, bar chart And here, yeah, this is it. Um, now, I, I guess if we let this thing play out to 2020 here uh, and in high speed. Um, <laughs> so 
certainly understand employment will always be important priority in our communities. People are looking for jobs or, um, or whatnot. I guess what I'm concerned about is um, it's not just the irresistible nature of pets. I'm guessing that's driving them to rise in the rankings. Um, what I'm concerned about is that that may reflect that this website is not terribly relevant to an awful lot of folks. I mean, beyond maybe kids who like looking at pets, I, I'm just concerned that when we look at what is highest priority here, it doesn't match what's highest priority in all the phone calls that we get or the 311 center gets or the emails or what I'm hearing on the street. And I can't say I've ever heard a constituent say, I love the adoptable pets information you got on your webpage. And so I, I feel a bit as though my, we may be missing an issue of relevance here. And so I, I'm, I don't mean to be hypercritical on this issue, but particularly as I think about the digital front door for a lot of folks who are really involved, it's really the 311 app. And, you know, I know we've had a lot of conversations, Kip, about how we can redirect our energies to make sure that, that we can get through some of the implementation issues of, of that app. And I just wonder if it's maybe time for us to be redirecting our attention toward that app. And then also just to be asking ourselves, is there a reason why in 2020 and in the middle of a pandemic, high levels of unemployment, and we get a lot of, lot of, hear a lot of frustration about everything from homelessness and encampments to trash and illegal dumping. We're, we're not seeing that any of those typical concerns that we might expect um, rising to the top. Mr. Mayor, if I could, I think it's a very good question. I think one of the ways that we are discussing this and have been starting to think about this is, is omnichannel, right? And that's a, a jargony word for what are the different ways that people access um, their services. And so I'd say a couple of things about that really quick. One, as a, as a government entity, as opposed to a dot com, we, we need to continue to have an omni-channel approach because we need accessibility of services across the board. So the way people, uh, the different channels that people access our services are in person. They just show up, right? Um, they pick up the phone and they call, uh, and hopefully increasingly our, our actual 311 center, now that it's an actual 311 center. Um, they use the mobile app, certainly for the top, the five services that are in there, plus a general uh, kind of catch-all category, number six, which catches a lot of stuff. They use our website. Um, um, and then, you know, they email is actually another portal that they'll, they'll access, right. uh, access it to. So I think if we want to understand comprehensively, what are people talking about? What are people worried about? What are people complaining about? We need to understand across all of those channels. Um, and we need to then be able to, to do a prioritization of, of our services and our response both based on that omni-channel piece and then making a decision, well, some things fit better on the website. Some things fit better on the app. Some things people are gonna to wanna to call and show up no matter what, what happens. And so where right. do we enhance the, the service process? So the, the way I would take your, your feedback is, is one, very useful. And two, um, to say that, that we need to have an omni-channel approach and, we, and, and part of that needs to be informed by the things that we know are big problems. I suspect, for example, that, um, uh, it, it, that a lot of the people who are, are having issues with, um, with trash and garbage and blight might be using our 311 app rather than trying to get something done on, on our website. But I, I think your point is a good one. And we, we're not going to take this data and suddenly say, okay, now our top priority, priority is optimizing our adoptable dogs and adoptable pets. Though I will say in the couple of times that I've ventured into that piece, the number of people who are deeply passionate about that um, is pretty damn high. And, and it's a pretty a surprising, uh, somewhat silent majority perhaps, but a lot of people who really do value those programs. But bottom line, I think we want to do an omni-channel approach, understand what, what people's concerns are, 
what our core services are and prioritize based on those. And I do think it does merit a look at the website of how that links in with that overall service. Okay, appreciate the point, Kip. I'm still wrestling this with this in my, my head. Um, I think it's a good thing to wrestle with. Yeah, I'm looking at like affordable apartments. I know these are not, I know you've got a whole lot more uh, web pages listed below this. So I guess we don't have the benefit of looking at the, what is it, you know, I'm guessing you probably rank the top 70 or something like that. Is, is that what we have? That's correct. I think affordable yeah. apartments is an interesting one, right? I mean, just to play with that a little bit. The reality is there are more people who are in a position where they're worried about cats and dogs coming to us than there are people with affordable apartments. 300,000 is not a small amount of hits. It's just that happens to be more, but it does suggest that maybe this isn't the tool or the place that people are getting the service they need around apartments relative to what they're getting with cats. So these, that's yeah. a very good point. I, yeah, I guess, anyway, I, I, I'm just guessing, <laughs> as we know about our community, this is you know always in the top one or two. Um, I'll, I'll, I think I'll stop there. I, I, I appreciate um, that it's, it's difficult to discern uh, what the, the lines of causation are here. Uh, I do really appreciate uh, the, the team engaging as they have with um, the volunteers from Harvard Business School. And I uh, really appreciate that, the time and energy those volunteers are given to us. Uh, but thanks, everybody. All right. Uh, just following off that discussion point, if our Leia Kokoka at San Jose could uh, clarify the difference between multi-channel and omni-channel. Uh, so the generally synonymous, um, there, there's kind of two terminologies and, and Mayor, connecting on your question, one of the big shifts we're making is to service delivery, not just the publication of information and what people can find. So if we do a better job of turning these into service access um, online and through those other channels, um, and when we do contracts and projects with departments, working with them to expose those services better through those channels, we will see a different breakdown of, of, of the state of flow. Um, and we deeply believe that because that, that's part of it. But the, the multi-channel um, is that when you put something out, it goes out on multiple of those front doors very easily. The omni-channel we kind of, is, is at least for us internal to IT, is we, we want that platform to be able to access as many of those as possible and what we build to be be built for that service delivery. Um, so it's just kind of the verb um, and the concept or, or the way to, to kind of distinguish the two. Yeah, and just to be a little more technical, Omni is, is a suggestion that you're looking at all of them. Multi is you may just choose one or two of them. Okay, thanks. Um, just, just kind of following that that general discussion, in, in, in regards to the uh, multilingual um, stuff that we're doing at the city, which I'm very happy about. And I know that we've we've talked about uh, having bots and, and uh, using software to engage with constituents in uh, or residents in um, in language, just using, I guess, algorithms and software. Uh, and I'm excited for that. And I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out. Uh, in regards to our social media and maybe even the city website, I think it would be more fruitful if we had designated pages in language as opposed, this, I mean, this is just my opinion, but as opposed to Vietnamese text uh, or Spanish or Chinese scattered throughout our city website for them to go look. And sometimes there's a Chinese translation, sometimes there's not. Just having a dedicated like San Jose forward slash like Chinese or, or Vietnamese or something where you can just go there and it's your one-stop shop for, for everything in the city. Because, and, and this is my opinion again, but I, I don't know that our, um, our, our monolingual uh, speaking communities are, are accustomed to searching for our, through our website to begin with. Uh, and, and we can train them by just giving them one front door, one entry point to it. Um, and that's just my thought, but um, I'll offer that here. Okay, uh, with that, can we get a motion to accept the report? So moved. Target. Thank you, do roll, uh, on the motion. Tony? Can I just ask who Lee Iacocca is? I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. That was a good one. Menez? Yes. Davis? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Jones? Aye. Yeah. Aye. Thank you. All right. I believe, is there, is innovation and technology strategic plan a separate item? Okay, okay all right, we'll go, we have no. one more. Okay. No. <laughs> 
And, and if, if I could um, add, Chair, so let me put up the, the questions. I, I know the, the Vice Chair said he'd, he'd like some more time to think about it. Uh, we, we are willing and, and wanting of, of any initial feedback that you have um, related to that. Um, but I also want to say uh, my apologies to the uh, previous um, uh, presenters. Got a little too eager there about um, transitioning in. So uh, sorry to Jerry and Kelly and, uh, and Matt and Trevor. But if, if council does have any feedback, feedback on this one, it would just be an acceptance of the item uh, once we wrap the conversation. And then we will be back uh, to you with um, a proposed plan in the future. Oh, so, so the separate item right now, we've already sat through the presentation. What, what's happening now is just a discussion of the questions. Yeah, because right. of my, eager, my over eagerness, you've, you've actually seen it already. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So that's, that's what threw me off. All right. Well, we'll let my colleagues contemplate the three questions and we'll go to public comment very quickly because I, I, Mr. Beekman wants to speak. Go ahead, sir. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for the words of the mayor uh, on the last item. His comments were really good. Uh, you know, it's always been my feeling that uh, to simply uh, to allow information when people uh, push the search button, when they go, when they want to search something on the city website, to develop that practice, uh, that can is a lot. That can do a lot, I feel. And uh, it, it speaks exactly to what the mayor is talking to. You've created a really good team. I mean, it sounds really good. And the mayor just asked the right question. You know, he brought in that real human element that's uh, really important. Thank you. Um, I, for this item, this is, you know, basically talking about our future uh, for the next few years, which I, I always like to hear those kind of things. Um, so I wrote a short little thing here that with the future planning for 2021 to 2023, I hope at this point in early November, we are all becoming clear with the idea there may be an expected rise in COVID-19 cases throughout the winter, and that we're going to have to work hard so that the previous 70 deaths a week across the Bay Area may only grow to a minimum amount of 100 to 120 a week. For all our efforts and worry at this time, this means to please continue to use caution and safe practices all through the fall and early winter. Hopefully this is becoming easier to say and talk about and uh, Thank you for, for your efforts. And, um, you know, I thanks for your patience. Yeah, with, for, with myself, uh, you know, and I, I got a little strong <laughs> and I'm very sorry about that. Uh, it is a good, really good presentation. It sounds like there is love in there. There is human, a human element in there that there hasn't been before. So, you know, uh, good luck to yourselves. Oh, and that, you know, these issues are, I, I think they're all related. They're all fully interconnected. And that's how I want to talk about things. So good luck to yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a speaker with the number ending at four one uh, five one four zero. Yeah, I've called in before, as you well know, and, you know, there's all this technology. Once again, the simplest things just don't work. And privacy policy, I mean, are things really private? I mean, you ever get pulled over by a police officer? They want to know where you're going, what you're doing. They got a camera on you. Are we really that private? I don't think so. I think this is, you know, this is nice that you guys do, you improve the website. Website's not bad. But uh, at the same time, look at how much money we have to spend for people who don't speak English. We have everything in 10 different languages. It's expensive. I must be better off to give English lessons. I don't know. But, uh, you know, this doesn't get the roads fixed, potholes fixed. Uh, you know, the 311 app, I told you, it's terrible. It needs to be better. I mean, the website's not bad on a on computer, but the... The three one one is awful. So is it Zoom. I can't. I can't say enough. Get something besides Zoom. Sam must have a, a buddy over at Zoom downtown over there. Get the kickback. I bet. Maybe. Who knows? You know. But uh, I find it. All this technology just doesn't get the job done. It doesn't time the traffic lights well. Uh, does you know the decisions that are made on a human level? seem to you know undermine any kind of improvements you make on a website and uh, like I said these roads haven't been paid for 20 years man we got hours and hours of discussions on how to make a better website 
I think the San Jose needs to get its priorities straight. There's all this illegal dumping everywhere, homeless people camping out everywhere. Is, is technology going to help with that? Uh, the human conditions remain the same for thousands of years. And uh, I think a lot of these technologies are, are complete overkill. Uh, and, and what you have needs to be improved. More, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, like I say, I always end everything with you people have some roads to fix. Back to my colleagues, um, any thoughts on, on the questions uh, proposed by Rob? Or if not, would he just approve <laughs> and move on? <laughs> I just want to say I appreciate uh, Chappie's comments on giving it a little bit of thought. So, I, 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 okay. Yeah. Yeah, Rob uh, Jordan here. I think with, you know, as we look out at 2023, you know, I, I think with innovation technology and all the great work that we're doing here, and obviously some of the folks comments that have been mentioned, I think one way we can really enable ourselves through technology is to be more responsive, right? And I think there's always, it's always an uphill battle. It's always a, uh, a struggle to be more responsive. And at some point you might hit a diminishing marginal return and, and, and flatten out on that curve. But I think there's a lot of work that uh, we can do to leverage technology for that. Um, and I know you are you know, hard at work um, in, in, in addressing those. And I think the crisis has really shine a light for the CMO side in terms of a lot of the work that needs to be done uh, that was done. Um, and so I think that's kind of, you know, as, as we think about 2023, it's nothing visionary, but it's just leveraging technology to be more responsive so that we can bring, you know, best in class uh, experiences to our residents. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, and there's no other comments. I mean, I'll take a real quick stab, just generally, not specifically to the three questions. I, 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 I guess as a city, we're trying to, to to find our way with centralizing the experience, streamlining it, uh, or or allowing or and and on the one end, if you streamline it, it, it gets cheaper because there's you know, economies of scale and you're you're using enterprise software. Um, but it also comes to the detriment of of innovation and and you know. Uh, what thousand flowers bloom or different offices kind of experimenting with different things that, that might be specific to their needs. Um, so there should be some sort of balance. I, I, I you know, point uh, like recently, since we were working from home, I think the city uh, adopted Microsoft Teams. And I, I know that not because we ever got a training on Microsoft Teams or there was an email that said, now we're on Microsoft Teams. But then one day you, you fire up the laptop and suddenly Microsoft Teams is part of the startup process and you have to kind of close it every time because you don't use it. Uh, but it's just there. <laughs> and so, um, just, uh, so if we're going to go that route, I, I think there needs to be some sort of effort to say, hey, everybody, this is, you know, we're pushing Microsoft Teams, not pushing, but like, you know, there's this tool available and, and here's why it's so great. Here's why you can use it. Um, you don't have to use whatever else you've been using, um, these, these competitors or these one-offs. Uh, and then at the same time, I think, I don't recall, and I could be wrong in this, but, but doing some sort of uh, department-wide needs assessment in terms of what, what we're trying to do. So I, I know that sometimes before we purchase something, um, there, there is a needs assessment, like how would you best use, you know, a CMR software or something like that. I know that that, that has been posed to the council offices, um, but I, I don't know in my four years here if there's ever been a just kind of, you know, what would you like to see us do as a city? What is the ability that you would like to see us do and try to try to find the, the, the procurement contract for, for, for those services? Um, so it, it's, it's on the one hand, the, the council offices and the different departments trying to do a thing which is engage with the community and 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 serve some unmet needs um, and then on the other hand uh, you know it trying to, to keep costs uh, reasonable and and you know trying to find uh, vendors that can do a lot of things but maybe not any one particular thing well uh, and 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 so that's that's kind of the balance I, I you know I'm just speaking to broadly um, so take it for what it's worth so Rob, Rob, when we give you the uh, the answers to your questions, you're going to have to grade on the curve on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyways, um, but then again, yeah. So I think part of this is also in the whole procurement thing, and I know we keep raising that as a committee. Uh, procurement's an issue, but I know we're also working on that. So, so there you go. Um, 
I know there was a, a motion to approve. I did not hear a second. I forget who made the motion, though. I think it was. I did. Okay. No, I All right. Uh, on the motion. Jimenez? Yes. Davis? Aye. Ricardo? Jones? Aye. Yep. Aye. All right, uh, the motion passes. Uh, I believe that was the last item. We'll now move to public comment. Mr. Beekman, go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, just, I didn't see the mute uh, thing there. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, the, the ideas of equity, uh, and what I just talked about, all the things I talked about today, all those things I think can be called equity. It can be ways that uneducated people like myself can be with people like yourselves who are more educated. And that's that's equity. That's working together. So I don't know everything about everything, but uh, it allows me to, to speak. And uh, I think that's an interesting idea. With the, um, my, my final words here, uh, in, in rules and open government yesterday, there was an item on beautification of San Jose. Please don't feel because of what you're planning for the future of fireworks issues in San Jose with its fines and penalties, this can be a time to start to begin to implement new fines and penalty ideas throughout other city government programs and by implementing new surveillance technology. This is a time of reimagination, not reincarnation, not reincarnation, re <laughs> I can't say the word, reincarnation. This isn't a time to reincarnate ourselves. Reincarnate. I hope this, thank you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I hope this S S S. Oh, I'm going to go past that. Uh, to conclude, simply, uh, I would like to please remind everyone that I feel Anthony Minor can be a very good police chief, and if not, I feel he is simply something of the example of how to find and look for the next police chief of San Jose, and then how to define the term uh, of reimagining, uh, reincarnation. I think that's the word. And so thank you for this meeting today and good luck uh, in all of our efforts. If I have enough time left, I've got 25 seconds, good. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I just, I, I'm really thinking about the democratic process and this is a time to really develop ideas of community and sustainability. And that's what I'm trying to work towards. It isn't to end our lives, it is to like continue good practices. And that's that's my efforts here. And thanks for your patience to listen. And we're going into new areas, so thank you. Good luck. All right, thank you. Uh, on to uh, the person with the number ending at 5140. Yeah, I, you know, like I've told you before, you get, the city needs to get back to the basics. and. Fines and citations is for bottom feeder people. Uh, you know, the, the people who legislate it are just as bad as the people who participate in giving out these these ridiculous fines and citations. I mean, the, the courts are closed right now, and uh, you're going to have more surveillance to issue more fines. It's just disgusting. It's a it, it's 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 a really cheesy, sleazy, tacky way of trying to get money. It's not because of what the person did was wrong. Not only that, you give out these fat citations. There's no crime because there's no victim, right? There's no victim. Some kid lights off some firecrackers. Was there a fire started? No. Was anybody hurt? No. But it's what might happen. So ridiculous. I mean, if you guys ever went to Valencia, Spain, you'd cry because the amount of fireworks going on there is unbelievable. And yeah, sometimes there's fires, but the fire department's ready. They're not sit, they're not sitting around uh, watching TV game shows like they do here. You know, do people get injured? Yeah, it happens. Who cares? You know, the the nanny state of San Jose is disgusting. And those three hundred dollars, those three hundred citations you people gave out, the city gave out for the bike lanes, you should be ashamed of yourself, Sam Ricardo. And San Jose PD should be ashamed of themselves. They're, they've got to be the most shameful department in the entire United States. They're worse than Portland and Seattle. It's unbelievable what, what they do and what they don't do. And if you guys have all this technology, how come it takes an hour for a police to, the police to show up at your house when someone's sleeping in a car? How come it takes 20 minutes 
for uh, the fire department to get to a house that's on fire and they're really only five minutes away, but the 911 doesn't work. All right. Thank you. And with that, uh, then this meeting is adjourned. Goodbye, everybody.